Welcome to True Crime Garage. Wherever you are, whatever you are doing, thanks for listening. I'm your host, Nick, and with me as always is a man that understands that a pony is not the best choice of animal to use for crowd control. He is the captain. (laughs) Every time I hear the word pony, I start singing genuine. It's good to be seen and it's good to see you. Thanks for listening. Thanks for telling a friend. And if you're horny, let's do this. Ride my pony. The petting zoo is permanently closed. Tonight we are drinking Country Roots by Tennessee Brew Works, garage grade four out of five bottle caps. Tennessee Brew Works works with local farmers. Just another reason to love drinking their beers. This is a silky smooth stout with hints of coffee, dark chocolate, and roasty toasty notes. Country Roots was brought to us by these good beer buddies. First up, we have Sean and Ivana in Jacksonville, Florida. Oh, Sean and Ivana. Sean and Ivana. We also have Nicole in Greater Manchester, UK. Next, a thank you to Jillian and Robbie on Staten Island. And last but not least, we have Jeffrey in Alcoa, Tennessee. Jeffrey says, hey, fellow Bucknutters, here's a cold beer. Go Bucks. Uh, yeah, go Bucks. Thanks to everybody who pitched in and filled up the fridge for this week's show. If you want to buy us around for next week's show, go to truecrimegarage.com and click on the donate button. And for everything True Crime, check out truecrimegarage.com. We're also on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, Snapchat, all that stuff untapped. And we use the handle at True Crime Garage. All right, Captain, corral those ponies. Everybody gather around, grab a chair, grab a beer. Let's talk some true crime. Twenty-year-old nursing student Holly Bobo went missing April thirteenth, two thousand and eleven. Now, where we left off, we had gone through the following years, and we have a situation where we have several men who are arrested. Uh, this seems to be the the cause for these arrests seems to be a confession from Dylan Adams. His brother Zachary Adams is the first one arrested and charged with first-degree murder. Uh, And then we have their friend, Jason Autry, who is arrested and charged with first degree murder. Mm -hmm. Two more brothers, Mark and Jeffrey Percy are arrested for accessory after the fact. And then we have Shane Austin, who seems to be working with the police in some form. Now he was granted immunity early on in this case. uh, But we have the police and investigators saying that they may seek charges against Austin at some point because he doesn't seem to be completely honest and completely forthcoming uh, to help them in their investigation. Now, later that year, after three and a half years of looking for Holly Bobo, her remains are discovered in September of 2014. When we left off yesterday, we said that we were going to get into these suspects a little more, and that's exactly what we're going to do. So now we mentioned that Shane Austin, we said that he was offered immunity in exchange for information regarding the location of Holly Bobo's body. Uh, police checked Shane's phone records, and those indicated that Shane Austin was in contact with Zachary Adams several times on the day of Holly's kidnapping. And the police believe that Austin helped dispose of this body. Now, this agreement between Austin and the authorities granted him immunity from various charges in the case, including all charges arising out of the disposal, destruction, burial, and or concealment of Holly Bobo's deceased body. It also included a provision granting Austin immunity for drug-related criminal activity, not to include any drugs administered to Holly Bobo. The agreement hinged on Bobo's body being recovered from the place where Austin said it was buried. That didn't happen. So then the agreement was withdrawn after Austin was unable or unwilling to lead them to the body. Yeah. The district attorney released a statement that said Austin has not been completely truthful, forthcoming and cooperative as to any and all aspects of this investigation. After that, Shane Austin's attorney filed a complaint against the state asking for an immediate and permanent injunction preventing the state from charging him in this case. So then in February of 2015, by now, like I said, we have Holly's remains recovered. And even before that, we have people charged for the murder, charged for the kidnapping, 
and some to accessory after the fact. A man once thought to be a witness in the Holly Bobo case was found dead in an apparent suicide in Florida. The body of Shane Austin was found in a hotel room in Bartow, Florida. There was no sign of foul play and evidence pointed to Austin committing suicide. Austin's attorney blamed the suicide on the continual threats of the prosecution, as well as the witch hunt style of investigation, where according to Austin's attorneys, authorities relied on rumors instead of evidence. Austin's attorney insists he had nothing to do with the murder of Holly Bobo and that Austin cooperated fully with the police. All right. What's your thoughts on this? Okay. Well, like I said, he seemed to have been working with the police for some time. Right. For whatever reason, either he was unwilling or didn't act exactly know the whereabouts of her body because it's not found where he said it would be found. Or it's a possibility that they moved it. Possibly. As well. Correct. Now, so his ties to this case, he has several ties to this case. One being that he is a very good friend of this Zachary Adams, who we already said had been charged with first degree murder at this time. Mm -hmm. He's actually the cousin of Jason Autry, who was also charged with first degree murder. So we have this confession from Dylan, Zachary's brother, and then we have Shane working with the police. They're gathering information. But at this time in the investigation, these guys are all kind of turning on one another. And each one is saying that so-and-so had did this. So-and-so did that. I had nothing to do with it. We got this circle of idiots all kind of turning on one another. Well, the facts are that each of these players or each of these suspects were involved on some level, but where they're turning on each other is uh, kind of, let me point the finger at you. So that makes me look less guilty. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, yeah, I did some bad stuff, but n I didn't kill her. Right. Now, the the two, uh, Shane Austin, the guy that committed suicide, uh, he, he hung himself in that, uh, that uh, uh, down in Florida in a hotel room. Now, uh, he and Zachary Adams, who, like I said, seems to be the center point, the focal point of their investigation. Maybe he's the ringleader of this group of idiots. But uh, they seem to have some kind of um, drug ring going on in Tennessee. They, they fancy, I'm guessing they fancy themselves some kind of, some kind of fake gang. Um, they seem to run around a lot together and, uh, were known to be meth addicts. Uh, they cooked meth. Um, mm -hmm. they sold drugs to people. Um, and then we have, you know, as I said, he's the cousin of the other guy who's been charged in the murder. And it seems that, that the real connection of Jason Autry to Zach Adams and his cousin Shane Austin seems to be his own drug addiction. It seems to me like he was going to these guys to purchase drugs uh, on a regular basis. Right. Now, let's get into those two brothers. Remember we said we have Jeff and Mark Percy that in July of 2014, the Percy brothers were arrested and charged with accessory after the fact and tampering with evidence. They were arrested on the basis of allegations made by Jeffrey Percy's former roommate, Sandra King. King alleged that in May of 2014, Jeff had shown her part of a video showing Zach Adams assaulting Holly Bobo, who was tied up and crying. She told police that she only watched a small clip and did not see an actual sexual assault during this clip. Police arranged for Sandra King to make a recorded phone call to Jeff where Sandra told Jeff over the phone that video of Holly, if it had been you in the video, I would have watched it to which Jeff replied. I know Sandra King also alleges that Jeff's brother, Mark was the one that shot the video, but to be clear, they are saying that they have knowledge that this video exists or existed at least at one time uh, when Sandra said that she had saw it. Now, authorities had not located this video. Both brothers denied that any type of video, anything remotely like this existed at all. Mm -hmm. And Jeff Percy denies knowing the other men who have been charged in the crime. Jeff claims that he was unable to hear Sandra during that recorded phone call conversation 
and that his ex-wife's name was also Holly. Uh, The alleged videotape, as I said, has not been found. Police have analyzed over 20 phones, over 20 cell phones, but have not found any video on those phones. Charges against both men were eventually dropped. Yeah, the charges were dropped, but karma will catch up to them. Um, Here's the thing. Um, We talked about... John Dylan Adams, uh, he goes by Dylan Adams. He's the brother of Zachary Adams. Um, well, just to kind of, let's kind of clear up this suspect pool very quickly before we move on to another one. So we have all these suspects. We have one who's dead and gone. Right. So we can kind of forget about him. He's no longer a concern. We have the two brothers that were accessory after the fact, uh, police believed, but eventually they dropped the charges against the Percy brothers. So let's go ahead and push them out and off to the side. We're getting a smaller group to be concerned with. Now, one of those people is still this Dylan Adams. Um, he's the one that confessed to observing Holly Bobo sitting in a green chair in the living room of Zachary Adams home, Mm -hmm. wearing a pink t-shirt. And he also says that Jason Autry was standing just a few feet away when he saw Holly Bobo. He also told police that Zach was wearing camouflage shorts, that black T-shirt with the sleeves cut off, and the the green pair of Crocs. Mm -hmm. Um, Dylan also reported that Zach had told him that Zach had raped Holly and videotaped it. Eventually, Dylan would be charged with rape in this case, related to this case. Dylan later recanted the confession and alleged that he was coerced Right. But his confession led to the arrest of Zachary Adams, Jason Autry, and Shane Austin. Many of the details con- contained in that confession were eventually found to be inconsistent with the known evidence at the time. Plus, the prosecution has been heavily criticized for their refusal to produce evidence against the defendants, missing multiple discovery deadlines and for making frequent changes to the charges against the defendants with little or no explanation at all. The other complaint is how long it took for the state to share evidence with the defense of these characters. So the arrest take place in early 2014, but it wasn't until July of 2015 that it was announced that the defendants finally received access to all of the evidence against them. All right, now we have to fast forward to this year. This is from News 5 in Nashville. Uh, The state granted immunity to Jason Autry, who was accused of killing and kidnapping nursing student Holly Bobo. Mm -hmm. A shocking development that legal analysts said means Autry likely knows something about Holly Bobo's death. According to court documents, Jason Autry, Victor Dinsmore, Michael Alexander, and Shane Austin were all granted immunity agreements in this case. Why is this important? Because we're finally going to go to trial in this case. They have charged Zachary Adams with murder and his trial is, was approaching at this time. Now we said Shane Austin, who was somehow connected to Holly's death. He was the one that committed suicide a few years ago. Autry, Jason Autry, who was recently granted immunity. Uh, he was already in prison when he was charged with his alleged role in in Holly Bobo's murder. He was serving time for federal gun charges of some sort. Mm -hmm. Uh, Jason Autry has always maintained his innocence though. The agreement that they reached will protect Autry by keeping his testimony from being used against him. Autry could still be prosecuted for his alleged role in Holly's death, but not for anything that he may testify about against Zachary Adams. Right. So this move by the prosecution obviously points and proves how crucial Jason Autry's testimony will be for the state's case against Zachary Adams. The body was so decomposed that it was probably hard to get a lot of forensic evidence off the remains. You're exactly right. Now, last month, um, in September of 2017, Zachary Adams was the first to go on trial. The prosecution's case was... Uh, circumstantial, we'll say, uh, as there was no DNA or other forensic evidence tying Zachary to the murder. Jason Autry, of course, was the state's key witness. And on day four of the Holly Bobo murder trial, he took the stand. And here's a clip from his testimony. I want you to start 
moment that you pulled into his driveway and tell the jury what happened. Pulled into the driveway. And I got out. The first thing I noticed was a burn barrel that was burning. The second thing was Dylan was standing in the doorway with a shirt off. Shane was walking around saying, y'all need to hurry up and get the goddamn hell out of here. And hosted on his side was a firearm. I'm sorry. I didn't. Can you repeat, please, your last statement? Can you say it again, holster? She couldn't hear. Yeah. When I pulled in, there was a large fire burning in a burn barrel. Dylan Adams was standing at the door of the trailer. Just moving it so you can talk. Dylan Adams was standing at the door of the trailer with his shirt off. Shane was walking around in the yard hollering, y'all need to hurry up and get the goddamn hell out of here with a firearm holstered on the right side. Zach was standing at the door of a white 4 by 4 Nissan Frontier. I instantly got to Mr. Austin and bought a pill, bought a morphine, 100 milligram, walked directly back to the PT Cruiser, broke it in half, cooked it down, and shot it. A few minutes later, I got out and walked back to the 4x4 Nissan where Zach was standing at the door and he said, I need you to help me bury this body. And I told him, I said, yeah, damn, I hate to tell kill little Jojo. And he said, Jason, he said, that, or he said, Train. He didn't say Jason, my nickname was Train. He said, Train, that's Holly Bobo. Some days before that, Joe owed some money for some pills. Him and Jack, his enemies, they was talking about killing him for the drug debt. Was there also another relationship between, or another connection between Joe and Zach? Shane. Was there a, a, a woman connection between Joe and Zach that you know of? There's a child, both of them have a child with the same woman. So you had, you knew there was bad blood about the drug deal, you knew there was bad blood about... There was some, some stuff that happened. The child, one child got uh, abused, maybe. When you said, that's not JoJo, that's Holly Bobo, what'd you do? I, I was clueless. I, I didn't know Holly Bobo. You've since come to know who she was, or is? Well, pictures, TVs, pictures, and stuff like that. So, let's be honest. Did you really care one way or another about the body that was in the back of the truck? I did not. Describe for the jury where the body was and what you did after that. The body was laying in a multicolored farm blanket, farm style blanket. It looked like multiple colors. Wrapped in the blanket, laying up against the back. So the truck is sitting here, it's laying against the back. Instead of laying long ways, it's laying this way. From the moment you figured out that he had, he wanted help with Holly versus help with the batch of meth, were you willing? Yes, I was. Tell the jury what happened. What you said, what he said. He asked me would I help him bury the body. And I said, yeah. I said, I will. And he said, but I said, There's under, I want to leave my car somewhere else besides here. I said, I don't want Shane or Dylan to know that I got involved in this. So I told him, I said, meet me at Yellow Springs Church. I'll park the PT Cruiser in there, and I'll get in the truck with you. All right, and so while you were having this conversation with Zach, 
Where was Dylan? Dylan never came out of the trailer. Right. Where was Shane? Continuing putting stuff into the burn barrel. And you say putting stuff into the burn barrel. Could you see what he was putting into the burn barrel? The smell, the smell was an appearance of camp fuel and meth. It was a large blaze. You could, the area was tight, and you could smell the smell of a meth lab burning. Okay, I understand what you could smell, but could you see what he was putting in? I could not see. I never, I never made it that far down. I never made it past the door of that four before front door. Uh, the door, I didn't hear the door what? I never made it past the truck, past the truck door. You said earlier that Shane was saying y'all got to hurry up and get out of here. Did he say why? He had a satellite. Uh, he said there was a guy coming to install the satellite and he didn't know what time he'd be there. So you had him saying satellite guy, cable guy, whatever's coming and throwing things in the burn barrel. You had Dylan first at the door with no shirt on and then never came out, correct? That's correct. This conversation took place between you and Zachary Adams there between his truck and your <clears throat> cruiser. That's correct. I got in the PT Cruiser, I backed out, went to Yellow Springs Church, pulled in. When I walked out to the road, he was backing out of 30 Yellow Springs Road. He picked me up, and I got in the truck. And we go towards 641 down P Road. Mr. Autry, you're, you've now gotten into the truck with the guy who says there is that Holly Bobo is dead and wrapped up in the, in the truck bed. So tell the jury what you guys talked about. As we got down, going down the road, I brought it to his attention that there were no shovels or pickaxes in the truck. How are we going to bury a body with no shovels or pickaxes? He looks at me and like he's lost. And I said, I don't know of nowhere a man can just pull up and get a shovels and pickaxes with a dead body in the vehicle. All right, keep talking. Continue on. Yes. We go across. Now, before you continue on, you say, there's nothing to there's nothing to there's nothing to dig. So what's an alternative suggested? By me. Alright. I told him that some years back that I had been underneath Interstate 40 Bridge and there was a body floating. And I told him, I said the only thing holding the body up was the intestines. Yes. Okay. And we set, we set a course that direction. Why did you mention a body floating? What did you talk about specifically? What was your plan of disposing of Holly's body? Mr. Gutter put her in the deep end of the slough. I told him, I said, you put her in the deep end of that slough turtles and she had to eat it up just like that. <coughs> turtles, animals of opportunity. So did you all... The only thing holding the other body up was the gases and the guts. I mean, it, it was floating. 
Just like I'm from the river. You see a dead fish, the only thing holding it up is the gases in the intestines. That's the same as it was. You get the guts out, down it goes. So you had a good idea? Had a I understand, idea. yeah. I've, yes, ma'am. Right. So where did you all go and who was driving? <clears throat> Mr. Adams was driving. We went to 133, I believe is the... We went to the 133 where the interstate bridge crosses the Tennessee River okay. underneath it. We made a loop of the entire area to scope it out to make sure no one was in the area. There's a boat ramp a mile or so from there. Also, there's a beach. And uh, we circled the boat ramp down by the beach, turned around, come back out. Not, not back out, but back up to the bridge, made the circle, and stopped at a pile of riprap. What's riprap? It's a large limestone rock, generally about this size. And you're using your hands to it, make a The riprap changes. But you're using your hands to, to show something larger than a dinner plate. That's correct. Okay. And you said you stopped beside... We backed into a pile. Is this an area that you had been to before? That's correct. Is this an area, or do you know whether or not uh, Mr. Adams had been to that area before? I believe he had. Well, did you tell him where to turn, or did he know where to go? He went on his own. Okay. We backed up to that pile of rip rip, approximately the distance of this to, to that. We didn't back all the way against it. When you say this to that, you just indicated the witness box to, to the, the jury box. Jury yeah. Yes. Approximately five, six foot room, room to get out. I got out of the truck with the right hand and I grabbed the upper torso of Miss Bobo. Jack come around let the tailgate down. I brought the upper torso to the end of the tailgate where he grabbed the legs and I set the head, the upper end, on the rip wrap pile. Did you notice anything about the blanket or the truck, the bed of the truck? Did you see anything? In the bed of the truck, there appeared to be a small amount of blood. Can you use your hands to describe what you mean by small amount? The, 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 the bed of the truck was ridged, like the bed of the truck, and it looked like it looked as if it had just lightly skidded over. And the blanket at the upper end of the torso that I grabbed had a small blood spot, maybe the size of an orange. Maybe the size of an orange. Did you look inside the blanket? Never. Did you unwrap? Never. How were you able to swing her body around and you get the top part and Zachary Adams gets the bottom part without unwrapping the blanket? I grabbed the blanket just like you would this shirt right here. <clears throat> the body didn't weigh very much. I was in pretty good size shape. I'm a pretty good size guy. I grabbed the blanket just like that right there. And walked to the, to, the, to the tailgate of the truck. At that time, he grabs the legs. We set the body down with the upper torso on that pile of riprap that y'all just showed, that we just discussed. After you put Holly's body down on the riprap, what happened? 
Mr. Adams goes to the driver's side of the pickup. <clears throat> I'm standing. I'm standing over the top of him with my hands on my knees. She being right here. And at that time, I see the foot move, a move, and a, a sound of distress that sound like hmm come out of the voice, come out, come from the blanket. At that time, I walked to the door, to the passenger side door of the pickup, and Mr. Adams was digging in a fanny pack. I told him, I said, this fucking bitch is still alive. We just stopped for a second. I walked to the front of the truck. I told Jack, I said, she's heard my name called and heard me talking and all. At that time, he wheels around, walks back to the driver's side pickup, <clears throat> Out of the floorboard of the pickup, he pulls a pistol, the same pistol that was hosted on Mr. Austin's side at 30 Yellow Springs Road. And I said, whoa. Hey, let me ask you something here. Did you say whoa because you thought you were going to save her life and stop him from doing something bad? Or did you say whoa for another reason? I said whoa for another reason, to go look. And I run all the way across here to about this area and look that way to see if anything was coming. How far could you see down there? Maybe 250 yards. It's a long, pretty long stretch from right here to the next curve. I looked around, and when I looked back around, Mr. Adams was standing. Let, let me stop. You said you looked around. Did you stay down there in the corner or did you come back? I stayed about here working back and forth, watching. What about looking the other way? There was nothing coming. I looked back <clears throat> this way and I told him there was nothing coming. When did you look back the other way? The way, the way that you came in on? Just shortly after I noticed that I looked down here and wasn't nothing coming. Okay, go on. I looked around and I told him that there was nothing coming close as clear, something to that, to that effect. And at that time, boom, the gun sound, gun went off. And it sounded like to me that it shot three or four times underneath that bridge. I had done made it back. I had done started my way back this way. And it sounded like boom, boom, boom underneath that bridge. It was just one shot, but it echoed underneath that bridge all the way down that damn river bottom. So that's the testimony of Jason Autry describing how he helped Zachary Adams with Holly Bobo's body and then discovering that she was still alive and Zach shoots her in the back of the head. Um, what happens after this is fearing that the noise of the gunshot may attract attention. They decide to load her body back into the truck. Um, and then at that point, Zach drops Jason off. Because now this is a, this Jason Autry is a strange dude. He's, he's a scary dude mm -hmm. and there's plenty of reasons why. Um, first of all, you hear him say, you know, he thought the body was somebody else thought it was Jojo because this guy owed money to Zach and his friends. Right. And when he's told, no, that's not Jojo, that's Holly Bobo. And the, the, the state asked him, you know, did that mean anything to you or did you care? 
He simply says no. He didn't care whose body that was. And that's because why? One, he's a cold-hearted bastard. But then on top of that, he's this dude is, has like a $500 a week drug habit. Right. So the only thing going through his mind, and according to Jason Autry, when he shows up there, he didn't know that he was going to see a body. He didn't know that he was going to be asked to help dispose of a body or who it was. Right. All he's thinking about when he's presented with the problem that Zach and these other guys have in front of him is that, you know what? Pfft, if I help these dudes, they're going to, they're going to owe me big time. Right. And this is my, th- these are the guys that I go to, to get my $50 morphine pill, hundred milligram morphine pill that he cuts into half. He cooks it up with some meth and then he shoots it. Now he said that his meth, his meth would typically last him two, maybe three days. One pill would usually last him about one day. He would do this twice a day and several times a week he would buy one of these pills. So really all he's thinking about, all, all he's doing is they're going to owe me big. I can feed my drug habit for free for a while because I'm helping these, these monsters well, get even, rid of this body. Even if it's not for free, this is my connection. So I don't want to burn this bridge, you mm-hmm. know. And the, the, you know, I said why he's a scary dude, but he's a strange dude because it seems to me like Jason Autry, the only thing that he is afraid of now, mind you, this guy gave about six hours of testimony and you learn when you listen to this testimony, the only thing he seems to be afraid of is his girlfriend because the whole reason why he has Zach drop him off before Zach goes and dumps the body is because he's supposed to meet his girlfriend for lunch. And he starts saying to Zach at some point, look, dude, I got this place that I have to be at this time. You got to drop me off. You got to get me back to my PT cruiser so I can go on my lunch date. Well, it's sad because, you know, the way he talks about it is so nonchalant. Like, this is not that big of a deal. Uh, You know, these these actions that we did and this these events that, you know, he lived through, uh, they're not a big deal at all. Mm hmm. And that, that this person, it didn't matter who who this person was, they just don't matter. The only person that matters is him and his drug habit. Mm-hmm. Uh, anyway, Autry would testify that Zach later said that he took Holly Bobo's body and left it in a spot near a place called Kelly Ridge. Now, the part we didn't get to yet is the actual abduction. What was presented at trial is that Zach, Shane, and Dylan... So not Jason Autry, not the guy that we just heard from, Mm -hmm. but Zachary, Shane, and Dylan went to Holly's residence, supposedly to teach Clint Bobo how to make meth. Right. Uh, According to this story, Holly came out of the home. She's screaming and hollering at the guys, and that's when the men decided to abduct her. Uh, the prosecution presented the this situation that Shane Austin, the guy that hung himself in the hotel, mm-hmm. uh, was actually the man that Clint had seen walking Holly Bobo into the woods. Uh, the reason why they presented this is he's the only one that would fit the size of the person described by Clint. Um, and there's no easy way to say this, but then the the three men... Zachary Adams, Dylan Adams, and Shane Austin. They they sexually assaulted Holly in a barn that was owned by the grandmother of both Shane Austin and Jason Autry. Remember, they're cousins. Right. Um, it's not, well, you can call it sexual assault. They raped her. And right. They're fucking pieces of shit. So the reason for this whole, this... All right, look, I watched enough of this trial and I and I watched enough of Clint Bobo on the stand and seen him in interviews closer to the time that his sister went missing and her abduction. They weren't there to, you know, I hate to break it to you, bad guys, but I it, maybe it makes for a good story for you dudes, but you weren't there to to teach Clint how to cook meth. You weren't there for that reason. These three guys went there with the sole purpose of abducting this girl. And had she not been there that day, they would have went back on another time and attempted to do it that day. Yeah. 
it just so happened to be that Clint was home and it, and they could read that in the newspaper that Clint was there and described who was taking her into the woods. So they came up with a good story. So when, when they needed somebody to help them dispose of a body, it makes them look like, Hey, we didn't premeditate this thing. This, right. it, this thing just kind of happened. The other thing that comes up in uh, Jason Autry's testimony is that at some point, Zachary Adams asked Jason Autry if he would kill his brother Dylan. The reason for this is at some point in the case, you know, we said Dylan had spoken to the police and gave them some kind of confession. Well, he was also kind of, he, he wasn't very quiet about what had happened. He was kind of telling other people as well. And Zachary Adams started getting worried and nervous that his brother was going to get them all caught. So he asked Jason Autry if he would kill Dylan Adams, to which Jason Autry says, let me think about it and I'll get back to you. Right. Um, and at some point he actually takes Dylan on a, he says a fishing trip on a boat um, and they're out fishing and Jason says on the stand, I thought quite hard and good about making good on that, uh, on that deal of killing Dylan when I was out there with him. Well, the particulars of that, remember we said that Zachary Adams had leached onto his grandfather mm -hmm. and he would, he would use him for money and to help him get out of trouble. Well, the grandfather had quite a bit of land and owned several homes and had quite a bit of money as well. Zachary Adams knew that his grandfather was close to dying. He was, he was in poor health. He was old. And the promise that he made to Jason Autry was, you know, you kill my brother. And then after my grandfather dies, I will give you some of the property, maybe a house and split some of the money with you. Right. But he, he doesn't offer this deal just one time though. No. No, he, 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 there's a few follow up questions. You know, every time he, they are together, uh, he, he's going to ask Jason again. Zach's going to ask Jason again, what do you, what do you think about my offer? What do you think about the deal that we talked about? And there's one particular time, uh, after they're smoking meth together. And Jason Autry tells Zach after repeated questions about if he would kill Dylan. He says, you know what? I, I might take you up on that offer. Uh, but if I do, you might be next mm. saying that he would kill Zachary right, right. Adams. Uh, some other evidence that was presented at the trial. There were two pieces of paper. Remember we talked about a receipt and a card from her school that was found. Yeah. Um, these were actually found near, they were found on a road where Shane Austin lived. He's one of, he's the person that, that hung himself. Uh, the receipt was about 75 feet from Austin's driveway. So they believe that they, they went back there shortly after the abduction. Uh, several other witnesses testified that Zachary Adams made statements implicating himself in Holly's disappearance. One was Rebecca Earp. This is Zach's ex-girlfriend. She says that Zach told her that he would tie her up just like he did Holly Bobo and nobody would ever see her again. Now, a 32 caliber Smith & Wesson long revolver was presented as evidence at trial. Now, remember, we said Victor Dinsmore. This is a guy that we haven't spoken about hardly at all, but he is somebody that lately, that just months before the trial, he's one of these guys that was granted immunity as well. Mm -hmm. This is why. Because he led police to a gun and said that Shane Austin and Jason Autry traded him the gun for drugs. Uh, the gun was found underwater, so no DNA or fingerprints were on the weapon. You know, this case, I mean, every case is difficult, but this one and, and probably with everything going on in the world, I mean, is there any hope for humanity at all? Uh, uh, well, I think, you know, let's talk about there's uh, people out there that have come to Zachary Adams defense and said that he's innocent. And of course his defense attorneys are going to try to, um, make that happen in trial. There are a lot of things that they presented. Um, and we'll go through those real quickly. Um, first of all, Holly Bobo's remains were found in a different location than what Jason Autry had told the police. Mm -hmm. It's unclear how the body ended up where it was ultimately found. You had said, earlier. And I agree with you. Maybe they moved it. 
um, meaning Zachary Adams and and the other guys. Uh, I be- I believe that you're probably right on this situation. Mm-hmm. I bet you that they they probably panicked and went back and moved it to a different location. Uh, we've seen this before in other crimes. There was a palm print that was found on Holly's car. Um, all four men, including Jason Autry, Zachary Adams, uh, Dylan Adams, Shane Austin, they were all ruled out as having contributed to that palm print. But, but that palm print may have nothing to do with the actual case, with, yeah. with her abduction at all. Yeah, you. it could be anybody's palm print. Yeah. The defense alleged that the state used unethical investigatory techniques to coerce a confession from Dylan Adams. So pay attention because this is where it gets very strange. In 2014, Dylan was arrested on federal gun charges that would have ended in a lengthy prison sentence. The prosecutor, who was also handling the Holly Bobo case, arranged a no jail plea deal on the condition that he go live with a retired police officer. This is Dennis Benjamin, who Dylan Adams did not know at that time. Now, five weeks later, after living with Dennis Benjamin, Benjamin called 911 to report that he has someone in his home that wants to confess to the murder of Holly Bobo. Despite the fact that this confession led to the arrest of the men, much of what he confessed to, it did not match the evidence. Dylan Adams states um, he's a mentally disabled man um, and that they kept him up all night and would not give him anything to eat or drink. Uh, and this ended up in Dylan basically saying, what do you want me to say right. to the investigators, uh, claiming that he would have said anything at that point. Um, Jason Autry testified to a series of events that was drastically different from Dylan Adams confession. Uh, he testified that he himself was not involved in the abduction. Okay. So let's, let's think about that for a minute. We have this situation. We have this Dylan Adams who's eventually charged with rape, and he's going to face trial at some point on these charges. We said that he gave a vague confession to police at that time. He's Mm -hmm. saying it's under duress. But, you know, we've seen many times in a case where somebody that is actually guilty of a lot more things will sit down with police and they will admit to some of the things right. and they might tell you who was involved, but they're not actually going to implicate themselves in any major crime being committed. So I personally, here's my vibe and what my gut tells me after watching all of Jason Autry's testimony. I believe him to be true. I believe that, that the majority of what he's saying is fact and what actually happened. Right. I have to believe that Dylan Adams in his vague confession that he gave to police was there was probably some elements of truth to it. Um, he named the people that would ultimately be tried for this murder. Um, but I think he was kind of making it up and kind of weaving the story to paint himself in a much better light. And therefore those stories are not going to match. Right. Yeah. Now, remember the Percy brothers. These were the ones that um, the police thought had knowledge of some kind of videotape showing Holly Bobo after she had been abducted. That whole story never came up in trial. The state never brought it up. Uh, There's no pending charges against the Percy brothers. Um, So that thing seems to have kind of washed away. Um, Maybe it was just something that the police got wrong. Um, I can't fault them if they got it wrong. Maybe, maybe they got it right. I don't know. But this, this Sandra King, uh, seems to have reason to maybe want to throw Jeffrey Percy under the bus. Um, apparently her son who's been in prison for like 14 years, he still has 24 years left on his sentence. Um, there's rumor and rumbling that maybe she was getting some kind of deal to, uh, implicate these two guys right. in Holly Bobo's murder for a lesser sentence for her son. Well, it's this case is difficult because, you know, I applaud uh, law enforcement, you know, to try to do anything you can to um, put bad guys behind bars, but you have to do it legally. Right. And, and you also can't, you know, how is that fair to the, you know, it's, there's no justice there. If, if somebody's going to give you a false confession so their son can get a lighter sentence, that person had nothing to do with this case 
they shouldn't be involved. Mm -hmm. You know, you know, if, if, if your mother wants to come forward and, and testify in a case, fine, but that has nothing to do with you. Mm -hmm. Now, Zachary Adams defense alleged that Jason Autry concocted this whole story in exchange for a reduced sentence, uh, and that only some of his story could be corroborated. Well, one thing regarding his testimony, Jason, Jason Autry's testimony, when he's asked, why are you here? Why are you testifying today? He says, because I'm hoping for, uh, leniency in my case. I mean, he's, he's, yeah. he's outright about it. He's like, look, dude, I'm telling you what happened because now I'm going to beg the court for mercy when I go to trial, uh, for my involvement in this case. Yeah. Uh, the state would also point out that none of the men accused by Jason Autry matched the witness description given by Clint Bobo. Um, they were all either too tall, too slim or too heavy to be the abductor. Um, as we said, Shane Austin was the correct height and weight, but Clint described a man with dark hair that had covered his neck. Shane had short red hair. Um, the problem with this, and this is what the defense would claim is that, you know, who that physical description matches. It matches Terry Britt. So Terry Britt, he's the stalker sex offender rapist that we talked about in episode one. His name appears in this trial because Zach's defense attorney contends that the initial suspect in the case was Terry Britt. And they said he's the real killer. Uh, Noting that he had never been cleared by the TBI and in fact, uh, stating that it appears that the government has more evidence of his guilt than it does of the three defendants charged in this case. According to John Walker, who is a U.S. Marshal, Terry Britt actually offered a plea to plead guilty to murder at one point. Uh, Terry Britt could not be excluded as a contributor of the palm print that was found on Holly's car. Well, and like we said before, or or at least I thought before, I don't know if I said it out loud, but it's like when he came up as a suspect, there was just so many things that at some point it's like, this is not a coincidence anymore. Mm-hmm. Something's going on here with this individual. And it, this case is very difficult because with so many drug addicts, it's like, who do you believe? Right. And, and like, and can you even believe anything they say? Because what state of mind were they in? You know, cause like his whole story starts off, with, yeah, I went in, got some drugs, and I'm super drugged up, and now I walk out and go, hey, uh, you need me to help you bury somebody? All right. Mm-hmm. You know, but you just got done telling me you just did heroin. Yeah. So. I, I But, again, I can only go with my gut. I sat through many hours of his testimony, and I, I believe Jason Autry to be telling the truth, or 90 five percent of his testimony to be yeah. the actual truth it's very chilling i do want to um, what was the verdict the verdict well on september 22nd of this year a jury found zachary adams guilty on all charges including first degree murder especially aggravated kidnapping and aggravated rape on september 23rd he was sentenced to life in prison without parole and two consecutive terms of 25 years for both the kidnapping and rape convictions. Now, Jason Autry and John Dylan Adams also face charges in this case. They will be tried separately, uh, and they have both pled not guilty, as did Zachary Adams. Now, regarding, before we move on, though, Captain, I do want to mention that Terry Britt guy who's been sentenced to prison for multiple rapes. Yeah. It's been known to stalk women. He was considered a suspect in this case. I think he, I think he should, that was good work on the police department's end and the TBI's end. However, I think at the end of the day, they got their right guy and guys for the Holly Bobo murder. Uh, but this dude is set to be released from prison. He's currently in prison right now, but he's set to be released next year. Uh, from prison. This is not a guy that you want on no. the streets. This is not a guy that you want living in your neighborhood with your daughters, your wives, your sisters, your mothers, any female at all. Um, if you live in that area, I know here in Ohio, we have block parole programs where you can sign petitions and give a quick reason why you think an individual should not be paroled. Uh, if you live in the state of Tennessee and they have that there, I recommend you sign your name on Terry Britt's paper. Yes. Sign your real name, sign your fake name, 
Sign your mom's name. Your cat's name. Yeah, sign your cat's name. <laughs> Jesus, I, I I don't know. I'm uh, I, I've been bummed out by cases before, but I don't know. Well, so we have two more trials in this case. It'd be interesting to see what comes out because Jason Autry was not really allowed per the agreement that they had in this in and what you can say and can't say in court. Right. He wasn't really allowed to accuse Dylan Adams of much because Dylan was not on trial. Um, but he will be. So it'd be interesting to see what Jason Autry says about uh, Dylan Adams, as I'm, I'm guessing he would be the state's key witness in that trial as well. So it'd be interesting to see what sentences these guys get. I think they're all very guilty. And like you said, cases have made you depressed. This, this is the thing. I sat through a lot of this trial and, and I, I got to tell you, man, it has affected me terribly. I, I, I feel like I have some kind of mild form of PTSD from this thing. I can only imagine. Well, I can't. I can't imagine right. what the Bobo family, uh, I mean, one for this experience to happen, to lose a daughter. And then so many years later to have to sit through the trial and hear what happened. I mean, I just, you're, it just breaks your heart. It absolutely breaks your heart. Well, so hopefully there's an update soon on these trials. And now uh, once we hear something, uh, we'll let you guys know as well. Uh, do we have a recommended reading for this week? Uh, yes, Captain. I'm excited about this one. This just came out about a week or so ago. I'm in the middle of it right now. I'm loving it. This week we are recommending Murder and Vesalia, The Coin Dealer Killer by Ron Colliard. Uh, this is about a stamp and coin dealer who was gunned down in front of his shop. I'm sorry, inside his shop. The police linked this murder to a death in another jurisdiction because just two months earlier, the body of a coin dealer in another city was found locked in the trunk of his car. This book is great. It covers the entire investigation from crime scenes to witnesses and autopsies. So check out Murder in Vesalia, the coin dealer killer by going to our recommended page at truecrimegarage.com. Hey, buddy, why don't you turn on that happy Gilmore, take a load off, and try to cheer up. And how about you try not to call me for a week? All right, I'll see you back here next week in the garage. Until then, be good, be kind, and don't litter.